Welcome to Regis World Literature Lesson 26. We're talking about French literature. Now, we have just completed our discussion of 19th century French literature and the three main periods of literature were Romanticism, Realism, and Naturalism. We also talked about Parnasse, and which was a, if you recall, a type of poetry. So you should know those, be very familiar with them. Now as we move from the 19th century to the 20th century, we're going to have four new categories that we're going to discuss. Surrealism, symbolism, existentialism, and absurdism. So we'll begin with surrealism. Now surrealism is an attempt to recognize that the... Uh, that the full experience of the human being is beyond the cerebral. And so they're trying to reach into reflecting, especially in poetry, but it spread to other writings, the subconscious, which makes it sometimes seem bizarre because it is disjointed. There's a dreamlike quality to this literary genre, and it's even though there is some sense that the reader is able to make of it, it's also difficult to interpret. You, you get some general sense of what's going on, but it's not at all clear. Uh, the technique was called automatic writing, which means that you're writing anything that's coming to your mind with no attempt to connect thought A to thought B to thought C. Um, just just writing as, as you're feeling at, at any moment. And so they will have this disjointed, almost like a dream. How a dream will move from scene to scene or, or idea to idea without always a clear connection to what's going on. Andre Breton, you'll want to know that name, is the guy who kind of created or started this new genre. And um, he was a poet in Paris. And from there, it spread to other writers. So it was a rather experimental step at, at the turn of the last century. Now, from there, it moves into uh, symbolism. So let's talk about that a little. Now, it's easy to see as we're getting into the next one, symbolism, that this has aspects. It's easy to see how it grew out of surrealism. It is a definite push against the realism and naturalism expressions in literature that, um, well, it, it's push against that and a towards uh, more sensitivity to the spiritual realm, imagination, dreams. It includes, um, th this next aspect would be kind of how the uh, art is expressed in, in literature with wordplay, uh, great sensitivity to the sounds of words and the musical connotation or of, of words as you listen to. So they're writing poetry, paying a lot of attention to how it sounds on the ear and choosing that. Uh, again, designed to build an impression here. Uh, it's subtle, sometimes difficult to interpret. It's suggestive as opposed to descriptive. There's lots of metaphors, symbolic images, as the name symbolism would imply. And um, it's, it's free verse. Free verse means that there's no fixed rhyme or rhythm. Uh, you could have sometimes just single phrases or single words on a line, and then you'll have a, a long line. There, there's no, uh, we're not paying attention to ending rhyme schemes at all, but rather the appreciation for alliteration or assonance or, and the sound of words is still being taken into account. It says it's designed to evoke, not woke there, but evoke an image rather than describe. So if I were to think of a Wordsworth poem, 
Um, that's descriptive. But if I were to think of William Blake, that's more suggestive. T.S. Eliot, difficult sometimes to tell exactly what he's talking about, but you certainly can come away with the general gist and flavor of what he's saying. But sometimes the, the details are obscure, and they're, they're, they are purposefully so. All right, so these are two non-French authors that would have similar flavor. Now, they're, they're separated by quite a number of years. William Blake would be the turn of the, the late 1700s, the early 1800s, right at the turn of that century, whereas T.S. Eliot's in the early 1900s. And so he is more contemporary with the symbolism period that's going on in France, contemporary to the period he, it would be more like a precursor, William Blake would be. Okay, I did not include any French authors, but do associate these two names with the symbolism movement. Now, the next we'll go on to existentialism. Okay, this next section is existentialism. Now, what I've written here are descriptive adjectives of the philosophy of existentialism. I've tried to be fair to uh, articulate some of the broadest ideas. Uh, there are many, many brands of existentialism, but there would be no belief in the creator or divine being. There's no sense of or belief that there's any real purpose or meaning in the world itself or um, life itself, but the individual then, what do you do in the midst of a meaningless world? Well, you uh, would feel disoriented and confused, and this tends to be the subject matter then a lot of a lot of existential literature. And but there's a a cry to do something to make to make your own self uh, meaningful in the midst of no broader meaning or purpose. And so the goal really uh, tends towards the desire for two things, to be your, your whole person, okay? That means all aspects of who you are, recognize yourself in many of it, um, its various attributes, and trying to be true to the things you feel, the things you think, the things you, um, you know, uh, you see yourself as defined by all your experiences, all your environmental uh, relationships, whatever, uh, as well as yourself, and and trying to understand everything that makes up who you are, and this cry to be authentic, which we hear a lot even today. Okay, and authentic means uh, somewhat more, I would express it maybe like true to yourself. That becomes a defining goal. Well, I want to be true to everything I feel or think. The uh, key leader of this movement or the one who really ushered it in in his writings was Jean-Paul Sartre. And these are the two uh, very famous Titles, No Exit, is a play about three people who are condemned to hell, and rather than expecting a typical view of what hell is, it ends up that they're just all locked in a room together. And, uh, in fact, I think he has a famous uh, phrase that comes out of that that says, uh, hell is other people. <laughs> so uh, so that would be the uh, one play. That's quite famous of his, No Exit. The second one was, um, I, I think, actually, a very, very, I, I've, I think I might have seen No Exit years and years and years ago, but I don't really recall it very much. I have no impression of it. But The Crucible is a play that I think is excellent, actually, and would recommend it to you. Not that the other, I, I don't know enough about the other to recommend it. But The Crucible is about the Salem witch trials and the idea of mass hysteria. It's a very powerful play, and uh, you might really enjoy reading that. Now, um, 
we're going to go to the last section now, which would be absurdism. It's actually kind of parallels this existentialism as far as time period goes. So let me go to the next page for that. Absurdism is a phrase that would be associated with this would be that life is either void of meaning or inscrutable. Now, Albert Camus is the, or Albert Camus, is the name we want to associate with absurdism. Again, French author, middle of the 1900s. And he is often labeled an existentialist, but he himself really rejected that label. He did not want to be known, nor did he think of himself as an ex existentialist, though when we look at this, it seems very similar. But what he's basically saying here is that uh, life is either void of meaning, which would we would think of meaningless, with the existential, or inscrutable. Inscrutable just simply means that it might have some meaning, but we cannot know it. It's beyond our understanding. And so he is the man you want to associate with this to famous novels of his. The Stranger is about a uh, man who, who commits a murder and, uh, and then is charged for the crime, and it's all in first person, how he's feeling, how he's thinking before the murder takes place and afterwards. And so it's very, first, well, it is first person, uh, stream of consciousness. In other words, it's got that sense of the uh, disjointed ideas, just as ideas that at almost that feeling of that automatic writing as ideas flit in and out and feelings flit in and out of his mind with little... Uh, connectedness. The plague is about a plague um, and how many different aspects of society are reacting to and responding to a, a they, they think it was pro probably about a col cholera epidemic. So in the late 1800s I believe was what it's supposed to be referring to. But regardless of that it's about a, um, an epidemic and many people dying and, and how they're responding to that and responding to others around them dying. So those that would be very interesting um, for you if you are interested in, in studying more and getting an idea of some of this 19th, uh, 20th century, or early, mid, early to mid-1900s and uh, how that literature is developing. So that's what I want you to know now. Um, that's the end of our history of French literature. It, does, it isn't that it doesn't go on, but we're going to stop here. I think that gives you quite a bit of idea. We've gone all the way from um, the epics, a very earliest literature, all the way up. Now next week, or the next lesson, what I will do is give you a brief review of that and hit the highlights one more time without as much detail. And what you would be expected to know then is how to define each of these periods, what some of the key characteristics are, some of the key terms I've talked about, specific authors associated with them, and the when I name them like this, the works that I name associated with the author. Okay, so we'll review it a little bit next time to try to give you the big picture one more time now that we've gone through all the detail. So you have a blessed day. Uh, I would just exhort you to keep up with your, even the class has been postponed, go ahead and keep up with your work and learning and your study each week while we're on this extended break so that we do not actually lose school and have to tack on more school at the end of the year. So just regard this, uh, the, re the assignments as being regularly, just as though you were coming to class, that you would study each week and learn the ideas. So that way when I do end up having to send a quiz or a test home, you'll be ready for it. Okay, have a good day.